Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Every church worker lives on a stage. Consider the roles that I've played in various dramas over the years. First, there was The Gunslinger, a story about an American cowboy who rides into town on a greenback horse. The town folk are cautious. They wait to see if his hat is white or black. Then there was Looney Tunes, the story of a younger, more energetic pastor burning himself up, servicing the needs of the elderly, and maybe having an occasional outing with the youth. Then Damn Yankees, the story of a carpetbagger from the North raising teenage daughters in the South. Currently, I'm starring in Out of Africa, the script is still under development. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the Apostle Paul wrote, Thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession, and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. They don't make movies like they used to. Directors like Cecil B. DeMille would hire thousands of extras and give them costumes and create elaborate sets on movies like Ben-Hur and The Ten Commandments to recreate ancient spectacles. Today's movies, there are CG artists who can cut and paste in orcs and goblins by the thousands for their battle scenes. Those spectacles that you watch on film, they took place for real in ancient times. And they took real lives. The captives of war were marched through the town, following behind the soldiers who had conquered their their city or their country. Along the route, thousands of jeering fans pouring their scorn and derision on them. And then, arriving at the arena, incense burned to the gods. That spectacle was consummated with bloody sacrifices of animals and people. That smell of the burning incense meant victory for the conquering armies. But for the captives, it was the smell of death. The passion of the Christ is a bloody gory spectacle. It was captured on film quite effectively by Mel Gibson and in the pages of scripture. But it's not a story of defeat. It's a victory. Why? God's son played his role to a T and he earned not an Academy Award, but the crown of life for every human being on this planet. Now, I may be a podcast producer, but I am not an actor or a director. The scale of this spectacle that I am in right now is beyond my comprehension. I really have to trust the author to bring it to a successful conclusion. It's by grace that I gladly follow Christ as his captive, as I march along the route and endure the derision, the looks of scorn from the people of this world, I anticipate the consummation of this story. But I need help. I need a, I need a coach. I need somebody to show me how to clearly speak the lines that he has written for me, because too often I flub them. And whenever I ad-lib, I get into trouble.
Too often I miss my cues. I come in late or I, I don't come in at all. I ruin it for others. At times I'm too busy paying attention to what others are up to. And I forget that my role is to remind others of Christ's impending victory. And as for those who keep their scorn and derision on me and what I represent, let their criticism fall back on them. I'm just a supporting character. God's son is the star of this drama. Moving from the United States to a less developed country means that suddenly you're living like the Kardashians. Middle-income Americans from the middle section of the country who aim for the safe middle suddenly find themselves in the upper income bracket of their host country. And it can really mess with your mind. You have access to electricity. Why would you only heat one room in your house for one hour a day when you can afford to heat the entire home all day and all night? You have access to good food. Why would you live on bread and yogurt when you can eat steak and potatoes? That's only a couple of hours to the beach. Why not visit? Even though there are many who have never seen that much water in one place. You know, the country of my birth, paparazzi and stringers stalk the rich and famous and snap pictures no matter how inconvenient or embarrassing the situation. Here, all I have to do is stick my face out of my gate and I'm a celebrity. When I lived in Bulgaria during the 1990s, I grew a goatee and wore funny glasses to disguise my non-Slavic chin. And as long as I kept my mouth shut, no one was the wiser. Not so here in Africa. Now, foreigners live in a cage. Society puts boundaries around me based on the prior behavior of other expats. Kids come up to me on the street and say in perfect English, give me money. When I pull into a parking lot, street vendors charge my car and thrust overpriced fruit at my window. Grandfathers greet me with the title boss when it's me who should be saluting them. And I've learned the hard way that my words and actions carry much more force than I realize. Let me tell you about the 900-pound gorilla. A 900-pound gorilla comes to your house for dinner one night. He shakes your hand and crushes your bones because of the strength of his grip. He sits in your favorite chair and wrecks it because he's too heavy. He slaps the table to make a point and smashes it to matchsticks. And he doesn't even realize what he's done. As a citizen of the United States, the most powerful nation in the world, your words and actions are viewed through the lens of history and current foreign policy and are amplified greatly. You know, that offhand comment you make about how stupid something is in your host country stings deeply and creates bitter resentment. Statements that begin, in my country, we do so-and-so, is received as an attack on national sovereignty. You know, the guys who rush my car with strawberries for sale are as annoying as all get-out. But it'd be much better to say, hey, maybe next time, than directly saying no or ignoring them. Now, the burden is on me to fit into this culture. It's not the money difference that's the barrier. It's my own attitude. You know, on some level, I want to remain a detached tourist who isn't bothered by the suffering that is everywhere. I want to study 
their language and culture on my own terms, but not be bombarded with requests to give help. Maybe I need to revisit my experience in Bulgaria. Now, I ate many meals in the homes of the two leaders of the Roma churches I started, but not with any of the other church members. I visited the homes of some parishioners for coffee, but not more than once or twice. I was invited to weddings and funerals, and they were lavish affairs, but I was also asked to help with numerous requests. I got closer to the Roma than most Americans or Bulgarians ever did. Why did they allow this to happen? In 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, the Apostle Paul wrote, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. You know, Christ was more than a prince in pauper's rags. He is the creator and Lord of the universe. He didn't put on airs. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not put out. He is the one who took the snotty little rugrats into his lap and sent the rich away empty. He has accepted me. Thank God that in spite of my insensitivity and the baggage that I carried with me, his precious word was preached through me to the Roma, and it produced fruit. And on my final sermon to them, I told people living at the very bottom of the socioeconomic scale in Europe that they were rich in Christ. It's not a cruel joke, but the truth is that in God's kingdom, the last shall be first. And as I witness the fruit of God's spirit here in Africa, I draw the same conclusion. My personal feelings of being on display don't matter. What matters is that Christ is one with my brothers and sisters. Only he can give them what they need, and he truly understands them better than I ever will. My role is to stay out of the way. Next time on Home Ties, all people are born into this world, and all must leave it someday. Yet death is something that only happens to other people. The country of my birth is filled with death deniers, but not so much in other countries. Funerals give you insight into your own mortality, as do close brushes with death. We'll see you next time.